I'm Miranda. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm quite fortunate because I've, um, I've attended the Do Lectures for the last sort of three, four years. And um, normally, and that's, I listen to the speakers and I sort of see if maybe there's a book that might come out of one of the talks. And normally I sort of sit middle to back and um, I realise now it's quite safe and cosy back there and this is the complete opposite. So I uh, just want to thank David and Claire for um, inviting me to speak. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about starting the business. Um, we only launched two years ago and so it's still feeling pretty raw. Um, and I'll talk a bit about commitment and I suppose essentially how like the last three, four years have probably been one of the most creative periods of my life. Um, so about sort of four or five years ago, I was working at um, one of the biggest publishing houses in the UK and I was part of an editorial team and we were working on an imprint and it had this strap line, books that change lives. <coughs> and um, the strap line had kind of been discontinued and occasionally you'd sort of see it on the back of like some of the older books. But I always really loved it and I kind of was always sort of campaigning for us to like bring it back because I sort of believed it to be true. Um, I'm not a big literary person. I don't have a house full of first editions. But um, I do believe that there's, you know, these sort of small objects can be very powerful. And, you know, publishing is a very collaborative effort. You know, you have the author, but you also have an editor, you have a designer, and there's a whole sort of team of, you know, I work with a team of freelancers. Um, and, you know, I do believe that, you know, the right book in the hands of the right person at the right time in their lives can really inspire them and can actually influence them and can actually change the direction of their lives. I think we heard Steve talking yesterday and he meant reference to book The Hero's Journey, you know, and that was almost a catalyst for him sort of doing something else. And that's kind of what I try and do with the do books is that, you know, what I want is for those words to inspire action, you know, and what I love nothing more is not somebody reading the book but seeing like, a loaf of bread that they've tried to bake or, you know, a little filing system, something like that. So um, I guess if I had a personal motto, it would be, if you want something done, do it yourself. Um, and it might come as no surprise, my grandfather was a Yorkshireman. So I've always, like, I love working with other people, I love working in teams, but I guess I would always be the one that would sort of, you know, roll up my, I've literally got my sleeves rolled up, um, roll up my sleeves and sort of try and make it happen and overcome the obstacles to make it happen rather than just sort of talking about it all the time. Um, mine was also the generation that grew up watching this woman. And I think, you know, when you've got a golden lasso attached to your belt, you can pretty much um, do anything. <laughs> like I have got an older brother and I was like not intimidated at all. I'd lasso his friends. Real a minute. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but, um, oh, actually, I'm just going to skip back, sorry. So I was sort of thinking about, oh, you know, is there a book that, you know, inspired me when I was like a teenager or something that maybe set me on a certain path? And embarrassingly, I thought there was a book, and <laughs> embarrassingly, it's not like a big self-help book or anything. It was by um, Barbara Taylor Bradford, who's like a romantic novelist, and she sold this, like, <laughs> And I think I literally got it off my grandmother's like, bookshelf. And I'm just going to read the blurb just to give you an idea of what the story was. Uh, it was called A Woman of Substance. <laughs> um, the rags to riches story of Emma Hart. In 1905, a young kitchen maid leaves Fairley Hall. Emma Hart is 16, single and pregnant. By 1968, she is one of the richest women in the world. Ruler of a business empire stretching from Yorkshire to the glittering cities of America and the rugged vastness of Australia. But what is the price she has paid? That it doesn't get any better than that in terms of like <laughs> book covers. So, um, and it kind of like, I don't know, it made, I guess it left like quite an impression on me. I think the story was it was like a sort of fictional account of her starting Marks and Spencers or something. But um, in terms of real life um, heroines, heroes, um, I was also given a copy of the Body Shop book. And I think as a sort of early company or brand that had a strong identity and, you know, a moral compass, you know, that's a great example. And if you Google Anita Roddick, she is literally smiling in every photograph. Um, I mean, of course, she's, you know, sadly passed away. But 
the book I was given, it wasn't like the business book, it was like a sort of skincare beauty regime thing with all their products. But I loved reading the introduction, and it was how she started the company with like scraped together four grand. They had like 700 pounds to spend on products. On the first day, they took 100 pounds, and everyone on the street in Brighton, they had uh, odds of like 10 to 1 that the business would fail. Um, and of course, she went on to set up this like global empire. Um, and, you know, it's a business that really resonated with everyone. You know, it was very much of its time. Um, so, about um, four years ago, we moved from London to Switzerland. We being myself, my husband, and our two young children. Um, the children, my husband was relocated with his job. I downed tools, and we all sort of decided to go as a family. The children were like really little, like two and five, and so they didn't really care as long as like we were with them. And, and also they sort of noticed the air suddenly got a whole lot fresher. Um, <laughs> head rush. Um, and it was a good time for me, actually. I think there's nothing like a forced sort of career break. And actually, what Claire was saying about motherhood, like maternity leave is a brilliant time because you have to stop work, even if it's for like three months or something. You know, and it does give you time to sort of think about what you might want to do. And this was another sort of crossroads. Um, and we got there, and I sort of had three months sort of decompressing, as I call it, from, from work. And, and I was able to, I was fortunate in that my husband was earning enough to cover our living costs. So I could sort of think about what I might want to do if I wanted to do anything different. You know, I love publishing and I love the industry. So I didn't want to sort of have a dramatic change. Um, and I guess it was like, you know, it was like, it was nice to have that pause. Um, and so I just sort of started reviewing um, children's book apps for a friend's website called The Literary Platform. Um, I was sort of reading articles about um, digital publishing because at the time the industry was going through a massive shift. It's kind of what had happened to the music industry like 10 years previously. So I was sort of reading articles and around that time somebody sent me a link to um, an online talk that was about books and iPads. It was actually about books on iPads. Um, and that talk was a do lecture. Um, I see your Costner. I raise it to Bruce Springsteen. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> if it ain't broke. So, um... I, so I guess the, yeah, that was a do lecture, and I sort of spent some time, you know, had a quick look around the websites, and I thought, this is amazing. I mean, the talk resonated with me, for one, and then I could see it was in a tent, and there was a heckling, and it was a bit sort of dusty. Um, I thought, this is great, and it was in Wales, weirdly, I was born in Wales, and I sort of grew up in Devon. Um, that after, by the afternoon, I'd emailed the info at address. I didn't know anything about the do lecture, I'd never been. I didn't know who ran it. Um, it was, I was acting purely on instinct. I sent a very speculative email just saying, this is great, have you ever thought about publishing books by people who, you know, your speakers? So I think back to the books that change lives. Thought, if actually, if we can publish these books, then they might actually help and inspire other people. Um, and I sort of sent it and didn't really think anything of it. I actually got a reply that afternoon saying that, yes, they had had the idea and, um, you know, did I want to Skype? So we Skyped, like, a week later. And actually, that initial conversation sort of set in motion, I guess, the chain of events that has brought me here today. I was to become the custodian of Do Books. It was kind of... It was... Um, I mean, it was nothing more than an idea and a conversation at that stage. Um, nothing had really been set up, you know, loose sort of business plan and stuff. Um, and it was like a tiny seed of an idea, it's very fragile. And it was a little bit, it was a bit like becoming a parent for the first time, in the sense that, you know, you can read all the books in the world, but actually, when it happens, you just have to learn by doing. So, I knew how to publish a book, um, you know, I knew the sort of process and what was involved, and I knew people that could make it happen, um, but I had no idea about running a business. So that was my sort of learning by doing. So I sort of did a bit more reading. But essentially, I thought, well, let's just... It can't be that hard. <laughs> it can't be that hard, can it? They all do it. 20-year-olds in Silicon Valley. Um, 
So, so I decided to um, give it a go. And I think really what the idea needed was, you know, a bit of love and attention. It needed a bit of funding and it needed somebody to sort of work on it full time to, to actually bring it to life. Um, so I sort of, you know, had most, could do most of those things, but I didn't, you know, we didn't have any funding. Um, and, and again, I thought, well, it can't be too high. Google investors. And uh, <laughs> it's like those came up. Um, and then I sort of realized, actually, I was sort of doing all this research that I didn't, I wasn't networked at all in those areas. I didn't have any contacts. I don't play golf. Um, <laughs> and, and it was like, it was actually quite hard. And I sort of, anyway, I did sort of find a couple of people who we thought might be interested. Someone like did all the costings, like Excel. And, uh, you know, sent off my business plan. It's like, this is going to be a shoe in It's like, so obvious, this is such a great idea. And actually, I did get a response saying, this is a great idea. You know, you love it. You have to do this. Um, but really, you know, we're looking to scale, you know, we're looking for businesses that scale globally to like 100 million pounds. I thought, that's like such a made up number, 100 million pounds. So I thought, well, even at the time, I was like, I had a very clear idea of what I wanted it to be and you know, where we'd sell the books and all that sort of thing. But I also know that it's the, there's very, like, small margins in book publishing. And, uh, and I thought, well, I can't make that promise. You know, I'm not prepared to make that promise. So, um, so I thought, fine. So I pulled together some, um, some family savings. I got a business loan for 10 grand. Um, that interestingly, I had to start paying back the month after it came into the account. So I was kind of like having the business loan to repay the business loan. <laughs> Um, and you sort of think there's all these grants. There aren't all these grants actually for startups, and I think that's where the country is. There's a lot of talk about entrepreneurs and startups, but actually, it's um, I don't. I think there's very little help actually. Um, so anyway, we got going, and it was all you know. It, the whole thing was done on a bit of a shoestring, which is fine because it does sort of you know refine your decision making process and you know the whole sort of creative thinking. Um, so I had the money, and, and I have to say, the first five authors, because we've published f five books together, because um, they were small, so we sort of wanted a group of books just to have like, more impact, and so that people could see you know, the brand and the series identity and what we were doing. Um, those first five authors will always be, not my favorites, because that's like saying I've got a favorite child, which I haven't, but they will always be very dear to me because um, they completely trusted me, and I didn't have anything, you know, I didn't have anything. I didn't have a publishing house. I mean, I was painting really vivid pictures at the time, and it's like, you know, you're going to be in Waterstones, we're going to be in Falls, and I could completely see that. Um, but, you know, I mean, I you know, managed to convince five people to actually write books um, just on a promise, you know, which was amazing, and they sort of were trusting me to make it happen. Um, and that was great because, of course, if I hadn't had them, I wouldn't have anything to publish. So, so then, of course, you know, you are sort of not blagging it, but it's like, well, you know, I then had to get a distributor, and that was I got the distributor by saying, well, I've got these five great books coming, um, and they believe me. So it's like, right. So anyway, you sort of go, you know, you go deeper down, deeper down. The stabilizers were off at this point, and it was like, right, peddling away, and uh, and it's kind of like. You sort of don't want to look too far ahead because it's quite an enormous task. Um, equally, I wasn't looking back. It's like, let's just keep moving forwards. So I was sort of having, um, chipping away, I suppose. I was just doing little bits every day, little bits every day. And actually, book publishing is quite nice because there is a sort of linear sequence. You know, the book is written. It's, there's a structural edit, copy edit, a design. Proof. So you could sort of, you know, you could sort of follow that path. Meantime, while they were, that was all happening, I was, yeah, finding a distributor because without that, there's no way the books would get into high street bookshops and Amazon and places like that. And we needed to be in there because if you're not selling the books, there's no, there's no sort of business there. So, kept peddling, keep things in perspective. So, <laughs> I remember one time I was like, I was, uh, I remember one time I was like washing my hair and it was like, this might be quite gross, but like my hair was like, I had like handfuls of hair almost coming out. And I was thinking, God, this, I'm like really quite out of my depth here. Um, but anyway, I kept going because I wanted to. 
And I think it's quite important, this idea of keeping things in perspective, because, because it's your thing, it's, it can become all-consuming. Um, and, you know, you think about it when you go to bed, you think about it when you wake up. And I was thinking, actually, I'm going to have to manage this. You know, I've got two kids. It's like, I might be bored. No, it wasn't good. It wasn't that bad. I'm sorry, exaggerating. But, um, and one way that I found um, to do that was to literally go somewhere. I'd go to a physical place, like the sea or a church, like somewhere much, much bigger than me. And actually, gradually, that sense of sort of scale would come back. Um, and it's like, actually, do you know what? It's book publishing. No one's dying, you know? I mean, it really is. It's fine. It doesn't matter if they're a couple of months late. My books are never late. Um, <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so it was quite, yeah, I mean, it was quite a challenging period, but it was fine. And also, I was driven by this instinct that I really wanted, not only did I want to do it, but I could see it. So it was kind of like, I was sort of progressively moving towards this vision. And my vision was 20 books in a series on one of those little spinny carousels. You know, like you have like moleskin notebooks. I've just commissioned a designer to make a carousel. So I'm like... <laughs> but um, yeah, we need a few more books to fill it, but I haven't told him that yet. Um, so I'm just going to... Oh, the commitment. So this is quite... I think this is like quite an old-fashioned word now, but for me... This has been quite an important word because at some point into the journey, I thought I've got to commit to this because otherwise it's not going to happen. Um, and it's like, you know, so that meant turning down freelance work. It meant turning down interesting side projects. Um, and I thought I've got to like dedicate myself to this now because otherwise it's not going to, it's not going to happen. And I think, you know, there are so many sort of choices and options now and you can live where you want and, um, you can have sort of different partners, but actually this idea, you know, it is like, you know, you prepare to commit to someone, are you prepared to like live in one place and call it home, are you prepared to like work at something until it actually, actually happens? Motivation. Uh, that's me, the fatty on the, uh, <laughs> fatty on the rock face in Cornwall. Um, I read an article by a woman called Gail Reebuck, who was the CEO of Random House, that was my big boss back in the day. And she spoke about um, being haunted by, her, about her generation being haunted by the unfulfilled ambition of our mothers and grandmothers. Um, when I was, they're, they're my two children. When I was growing up, um, I, was, I was quite amazed to discover that my grandmother had trained to become a solicitor. And that was like in like the 1800s or something. No, it's like 1930s or something. But anyway, it's quite rare. And I thought, God, that's amazing, because that was like granny who just sat there knitting. And, and she, she, uh, she qualified, but she never practiced because she became pregnant with her first child. She went on to have five children, five boys, nightmare, one of whom was my dad. And she also had this lifelong ambition to become a writer, and she did publish a book, but she was like 60 when it happened. Um, and I don't think she'd have wanted things to be different, but it was just like circumstances meant that she could never follow that path, you know. Um, my maternal grandmother lost her husband in the Second World War, um, so had to raise my mum and her brother as a single parent. There were lodgers coming into the house. It was all very unsettled. So when my mother came along, she wanted to have like a very stable and secure family life. Um, and I guess me and my brothers really sort of benefited from that enormously. You know, we, you know, we were sort of educated and we were loved and we were guided. Um, and essentially, I was given a clear runway, right? I was, you know, there was no excuse for me to not do something. You know, it's like there's no war going, you know, the bombs aren't dropping. You know, it's like so... And for me, it was quite important. So I've always had this sense of being past the baton, um, by them, and it's like, well, you know, maybe I need to do this because they couldn't, you know, and actually, and also it was really important for me that once we had, I had children, that I didn't just coast along, raise it. I mean, they're fine. You know, I haven't been with them for four days, but I mean, they're fine. You know, I've got a great husband, and he's like looking after them, and he's, you know, managed things, and, um, and also they're really, 
they're part of this process. So the, sort of the whole book thing is like, it's almost like part of the family now. Um, you know, and they get more excited than I do if they see a do book in a bookshop. They're like, so they're like my biggest champions now, um, which is great. I mean, I get really excited, but they go <laughs> mental. Um, and, you know, and I guess I'm sort of quite fortunate as well because I've, you know, I'm surrounded by, in, you know, just from doing this, really inspiring and creative people, and that keeps me really motivated. So it kind of like a lot of the time, Yes, I'm pulling my hair out, literally, but, um, you know, a lot of time it doesn't feel like a job, you know, because I'm sort of in this place. Um, and I think, you know, this is really just the beginning as well. I mean, I feel like I've, like, come, you know, done this, like, huge push, this boulder up the hill. But actually, this is, this is just the beginning. You know, we're only just the books are starting to be translated into foreign languages. You know, we're getting the do message out there. We've got an American distributor now. We've got an Australian distributor now. I'm speaking to people in Asia. So it's kind of like, yeah, and that's like really exciting. So, oh yeah, fly the plane. <laughs> if you've got a clear runway. Um, and thanks to Millie. Obviously, I didn't do these illustrations. Not like the other speakers. Um, Millie Morata did them, um, and she's an amazing illustrator. So yeah, thank you. That's the end. <laughs>